section, the first major topic before we get into the actual science and math of engineering is what is engineering physically? So we're going to cover a few objectives here. But before I even get into those objectives, based on your reading last night, pages 5 through 11, for those that had the right to the next book, what do you think in your own words is engineering? Physically, what would you say in your own words is engineering or examples of engineering or something that's involved? Right. Application of science and math, okay. Given a, it's, it's problem solving in its advanced, in advanced stages. Math and science, applying math and science to a complex problem, and then interdisciplinary work that's involved. And that's the first thing you probably saw when you were reading through 5 through 11. One of the big things is that you work in groups a lot as an engineer. Now, if you don't plan on being an engineer, it doesn't mean that what you're learning here is not going to help you, depending on what job you have. You're going to probably work hand in hand with engineers all the time. If you're in a business field, you're going, to, you're going to constantly work with engineers. Maybe you're a consultant that works with engineers. Maybe you work for um, New York City, some, some, some one public office for New York City. Well, you're always going to be working with engineers, with public jobs, and public works, all different things. So the biggest thing about engineering is that it's everywhere around you. It's everywhere around you. There was also a part in your book, I think it was like the first section or the first part of the chapter that said, when you wake up in the morning, look around you. Try to look at things around you and figure out and say to yourself, everything around you involves engineering. Think about how. How that is like this table, obviously, to build anything involves some form of engineering. Anything electronic around you literally that exists involves some form of engineering. So it's everywhere. That's the whole idea. And that's why you hear people all the time talk about, when they talk about job security, when you're younger and you hear about jobs that like there'll always be need for things, you always hear there's jobs for nurses. Doctors and nurses, the medical field. You always hear there are jobs for engineering. Why are there always jobs for engineering? What do we constantly want to be doing in, in you know, life? There's evolution and innovation. Yeah, improving things and innovating. And evolution, that works too. Yeah, you are involved sometimes. So you want to improve on things. You want to get things better. You want to be more efficient in life. If you think about a simple company like Amazon. Amazon is an amazing example of engineering at its finest. When you think about the production line processes that go into, uh, into Amazon, the packaging, the fact that it's not actually even humans that are doing it, that it's all machines that are doing this packaging, it's kind of scary actually and crazy. So you also have to consider the, not ethical dilemmas, but I guess the ethical dilemmas of things like machines replacing human, jo human jobs. That's another big thing in the 21st century, and one of the or several of the few leading scientists now are scared for human existence when it comes to machines. Because machines are taking over a lot of jobs. We notice more and more that there's so much of a surge in unemployment. And a lot of the reasons for that is not just the fact that like people might not be A, qualified, or B, have enough school under their belt to get that job, but those jobs are physically being replaced. So as much as engineering is awesome, and I, you know, you know, I study engineering, so I love learning about engineering. It's not always something that might help humanity. Give me an example of an engineering feat that did not help humanity at all. I can think of several. An engineering feat, something amazing in a sense, but it did not help humanity. Bless me. Nuclear bomb. Nuclear bomb. That's a prime example of that. Well, Without engineering, you're not making a nuclear bomb. You need to actually have that research, the science and math that went into it. And that did, I mean, you might argue that it helped humanity by ending a certain war and stuff, but it didn't help humanity in the sense that we're, you know, now a much more violent uh, race, or whatever species, rather, not race, species. What else? What's another example? Something else? Uh, you live in New York City. You can make an argument for you can make an argument for a lot of things. Absolutely, John. That's why I said I can think of a million things. Think of something else. Come on. Try to come up with your own example. What's another thing in engineering that, in the end, somehow caused some suffering for humanity? Let's say that, instead of didn't help humanity. I guess you can say that, um, all the new weapons that came out of World War I, tanks and machine guns and cluster guns. 
any new weapons, especially I was going to go to chemical stuff. Very good. So chemical weapons. What I was thinking were chemicals. Where else are chemicals not good? Pollution. Pollution is one. Okay, good. Engineering has created a ton of pollution. A ton. All the byproducts, right? What else? Where else are chemicals all the time that are not really good for you? Where? I heard it somewhere. In food. In food. In food. I heard somebody say food. In food. Think about food all the time. Think about the rise of things like um, autism. A lot of different new, not new, but more prominent, I don't want to use the word disease. Is autism a disease? Is it considered a disease? Disability or disease, one or another? Okay. Think about the rise in a lot of things, a lot of new, um, a lot of new ailments that people suddenly are having more and more of. Think about that. Like, where does that all come from? It's not just a matter of evolution there. There's something that's causing that. There's something that's changing the way the biological system in your body is working nowadays. So chemicals are huge. Um, I was personally thinking also about infrastructure. Think about how many times you hear in the news of something collapsed. A building, a floor, a bridge, some sort of a structure. So yeah, engineering helped us to bridge the gaps. No pun intended, but literally bridge gaps in humanity, but also it's not really helped us all the time when we have these disasters. So today we're also going to take a minute and look at not only accomplishments, but some failures. Why is it important that you need to look at failures? To have, see how to improve, not to repeat it, to learn from it. Good, all good answers. You have to. If you don't, it doesn't make any sense. Make the same bridge that fell in the past, it's going to fail again. Even if it was some extenuating circumstance. It's called Monaros, we'll talk about it at some point in this lecture. How many people know about the Coman You know about it? Okay, so that's good, actually. So we'll talk about the Coman but it was a bridge. Yeah. And it happened to fail in this very, very particular state. All the conditions needed to be perfectly right for this bridge to fail. But one day, all those conditions were met, and that bridge failed. So they learned from that. They didn't build a bridge in the same fashion, or maybe they reinforced part of it. Anybody know, anybody been following the New World Trade Center construction? One, one, whatever it's called? Do you know about the, the, the improvements in civil engineering they've been doing? Yeah. Do you know what I've talked about, maybe one or two of the things you've read about or one about? Well, first, like, An example? 50 feet is it has a solid core. Which in the past it did not. What was the core made out of the old ones? Uh, Anyone know? Steel. It's all steel. Yeah. And what happened? Yeah, yeah. yeah. the jet fuel caused a lot of that to melt. And which is what really ended up causing the glass. So, what is it, the first half? What's your It's like basically, if, if you run up the building, you can't knock it down with any ball on top of your chest. It's like unbelievable. I mean, and obviously, after what happened, not only are they trying to make it better, but they're trying to make it indestructible in a sense, right? And that's the whole concept there. Um, so, you have to learn from those mistakes. Pete? Is this like another building? No, no, the, the new one that's built. Yeah, the free, it's called the Freedom Town? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the Freedom Town. So one I think it's done, right? Yeah. Pretty sure it's like completely finalized now, yeah. Yep. Johnny. What is the format? Don't know. My, well, just thinking, right? Outside the box. I really have not read about this, but just use logic. I'm thinking it's going to be part of concrete for sure. Because you're going to notice concrete's not going to melt. It, high, even high enough temperatures, you're not going to have problems with concrete melting before it gets like scorched and weakened. Um, I'm guessing there's probably also steel still, some sort of reinforcement. And then I'm probably guessing that there's a casing around this core that prevents certain temperatures from melting what's inside of it. Maybe it's something that prevents some sort of black box radiation that keeps out all the heat. It's probably insulated very well so that nothing would cause that to melt or fail. Um, but I don't know. I, didn't, I have not read about it. But I know that they've been doing obviously a lot of improvements because of what happened. It's the old school trip dinner had I means that are quarter half inch thick and that's easier to go through. But if you only steel would be a much bigger area, it's not that easy to go through. Okay, so that they changed the geometric constraints on it. Do we know what I beam is? So we're all familiar? An I beam literally looks like an eye. So part of the beam is going to look like this. You've seen these structures all over. If you're walking down Lexington and they're doing all that work and you look up, you're going to see a beam and the beam comes out towards you. Imagine this is three-dimensional coming out toward the roof. Okay, so the beam is literally this long, but that's the shape of it. 
The reason I beams were invented, in addition to box beams and uh, and the other ones that are called what's the third type? The reason they were invented, they provide the same structural stability in forces. Like so, if you're trying to combat a certain amount of force that would affect the building or affect the structure, that a solid block would, but with how much less material? It's all about saving money, right? So all this material that might be there, if this were a solid like beam of, of steel, is not there. So you save a ton of money while it still resists the, the, bending, the bending motion of the building and the twist of both. So when I took a class on solid mechanics and design, we literally looked at beams for like at least three or four weeks. The different designs, the math behind it, how you can determine exactly how much force it would stir. How much force it actually could withstand and how much of a difference that has when compared to the actual solid beam. Um, what else? All right, let's get into these objectives here. Let's get into these objectives. So we're going to talk about the progression from being like a young person who likes to build stuff to actually designing things. Um, talk about the branches of engineering, some historical significance, looking at some sort of, uh, I guess we call like the fathers of engineering, then talk about some accomplishments and catastrophes in engineering itself. First, let's talk about etymology. Okay, etymology. So this Latin term really represents cleverness or to contrive or derive or devise something. So when you're thinking about engineering, just think about the fact that when you're doing something that involves engineering, you're always designing something. Okay, and when you're in engineering, if you end up taking it in college, you're going to become an engineer, you're going to hear about the fact that it's all about the design process. Okay, it's all about the design process. And when I was a freshman as an engineer, I probably wanted to shoot my professor every time I heard that because it's all I ever heard. Until I actually went through school for a couple years, I didn't really recognize what they were talking about. So the idea of always, always being able to design something and improve upon it. Um, there's a saying, what is it? Um, there's a saying pretty much that, you ever hear like, if it's not broke, don't fix it, or don't reinvent the wheel kind of saying, meaning like, if there's something that already exists, don't, don't you don't have to come up with something even better, it's already there, you know, don't waste your time. Well, the whole concept of engineering is kind of the opposite of that, really. It's saying, like, you know what? If something isn't broke, maybe it's not being used to its full capacity. We could push it, push it to the limits a little bit more. Or if there's an item that does a good job, can I make it better? So I'm going to reinvent the wheel. And as you obviously know, many times over, people have reinvented things. What's an example of something maybe in the last 10 years that's been reinvented? Completely reinvented. Give me an example. Cell phones. Great example. I mean, think about, when, when I was younger, cell phones literally only had little digits on it. That was it. And they were all flip phones. There wasn't even, didn't even exist to have a screen on something. It was a flip phone, like little pixels and stuff. And you couldn't even see pictures, anything. So a huge reinvention. What else? Computers. 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 I mean, we're talking about going from, if you, I don't know if you know this, but one of the first computers was bigger than this room, and a simple, like, electronic watch has more memory on it than a, room, a computer that big did back in the day. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, maybe like safety cars. Say again? Safety cars. Yeah, absolutely. And this year, actually, we're going to talk about that for a while. We're going to talk about how they redesigned a lot of cars for safety. They moved around where the gas tanks used to be located. They moved where the seats were. A lot of people were dying from impacts, especially side impacts. Right? No? Good. Yeah, so there are so many things, obviously, that have been reinvented. So yes, as much as we might want to say, like, don't reinvent the wheel, as an engineer, that's kind of what you're doing all the time. You're coming up with better ideas and ways in order to uh, help further science and technology and humanity. All right, so here's your progression. So when you're younger, as a kid, what might be some traits of someone who will become an engineer? Like, how would you recognize that your son or daughter, when you're older, might be the kind of kid who's, like, really going to be good at this? Legos, like the buildings. What else? Someone who's really creative. Yeah, curious. curious. And what? <laughs> Play Doh? Play Doh? No, that, that makes sense because you're designing things. You're artistic. Interesting. Like they take interest in seeing engineering. 
Yeah, so they're interested in advancements in engineering and things that are coming up all over the world. Absolutely. Um, if, I don't know, this is another thing I'm thinking of. Have you ever met somebody who just loves to take stuff apart? Like, like literally, like when, I, I can't explain. When I was younger, I was not like super into that. I, I liked building things and stuff, but I never got into like taking things apart. But I had friends when I was a kid, because I, so I did this thing called, uh, it was like a revolving doors gifted program for science and math students. And I would be in this program, and I, I like science and math, but I was in there with kids who, at the age of like 10, were taking apart electronics, rewiring it, figuring out how it works, just by tinkering around. So that creative nature, you're going to see a lot in people and young kids who eventually become engineers. Um, as a student, usually it's someone who's a good problem solver, who's good at math and science, who likes to think outside the box and come up with ways to have better solutions to problems that might not be solved in an optimal way. Um, and then as a professional, there are two, two forms of engineering, really. Two forms. Industry and education. They're both just as important. Think about it. If you don't have someone who can teach engineers, you can't have engineers. So the biggest field in engineering right now is actually professors of engineering and research. All of the new products and stuff come out of research and design. Where does the funding come from that? It comes from university. Where does that come from? It comes from sometimes public grants, sometimes private grants. But these researchers at universities, these professors that have like a slew of 30 graduate students working for them, working in the lab, coming up with ideas. That's where a lot of your engineering applications come from. Then, obviously, you have professional engineers who work on a daily basis as an engineer, probably for an engineering firm, who have an engineering license, who are able to sign off on drafts for buildings, or sign off on electrical footprint, uh, blueprints for some new structure or something else. So when it comes to a professional, you have the researcher slash professor, and then you have the professional engineer that works in industry, those two things. Do you have like a dream job that you want like straight out of college? Or did you Me? Want, like did you want to teach engineering? Um, when I was in college, I loved learning engineering. I really did. In grad school, I absolutely loved. I never really liked research though. So when I was in grad school, I chose the non-research op research option so I took a lot of classes. I, I like just learning about math and science. And then when I was graduating from grad school, I wasn't really sure I wanted to work like in an office setting as a professional engineer. So I kind of strayed away from that. And I was like, I want to stay in the like teaching area. So I entered a volunteer corps, and that's how I ended up teaching. So I didn't really ever say to myself, like, oh, I want to be a teacher. It never crossed my mind when I was younger. It wasn't until I was kind of finishing up engineering that I recognized that I didn't want to be in an office doing, in a sense, it's not correctly, or grammatically correct, but doing engineering every day. I had internships, um, and those internships probably were probably the worst thing I could have done, but the best thing I could have done. Um, in a sense that they really pushed me away from engineering, because I didn't like them. I had an internship at Parsons Engineering in the city, down in uh, lower Manhattan, and then one out in Long Island, a small engineering firm, Green and Peterson. Um, and for two summers in a row, between sophomore and junior year, and between junior and senior year, I did those internships. And they didn't really utilize what I felt my capacity was. I was doing stupid stuff because I was an intern. So to me, it like morphed my view of what I'd be doing all the time. And I think it really impacted the fact that I didn't go on to be an engineer. But at the same time, you know, there's the, you know, you see, you don't see it now, but now you see it. Like, I wouldn't have been a teacher, obviously, I had done that. And I do like teaching, obviously, you guys know that. Or else I wouldn't still be doing it. So I don't see myself changing, but long term, I think I'm going to become a professor of college. But probably not for at least 10, 15 years. I like teaching high school. I think it's fun. It's more energetic. Uh, I'm like, you know, I, I like coaching and stuff. I'm involved doing that. So, but I think, like, you know, if I one day have a family, which I hope to do and stuff, I'll go to be a professor. You get a lot more time for your family. You could then get paid to do research when as, a, as a professor, as opposed to when I was a grad student. I was kind of like, I just, being told to do this, you know? So, that's kind of what I want to do eventually. Yeah. All right. Now, I don't need you to read this out loud. We don't have to read this out loud together. But what I do want you to do real quick is simply read this to yourself, please. Read through these five quotes of what people perceive engineering to be. Take a minute, just read through them. You don't have them over. 
uh, overly analyzed it, it should be early. Okay, science, math. So no matter what people can conceive engineering to be, you're designing things and you're applying them to math and science. So when I was talking yesterday in my physics class for this year, um, they were asking about what physics is going to be like for the year, and I was trying to give them an overview. And the easiest way I was able to explain physics to them was by saying, like, you know what, you're going to take what you learn in math and science, and you're going to apply it to real life stuff. And really what you're thinking about there is engineering. And I actually pulled this up and showed them, and I said, well, here's some definitions of engineering. It's kind of what you're doing in physics, but taking it to the next level. Okay, you don't just stop and look at theoretical stuff. Now you actually might be building stuff. You might be actually putting that to use. Okay? Um, I was joking last year. I forget. I wasn't joking, but somebody was, and then we started joking about it. Um, have you ever urban dictionary the term engineer before? It, it's funny because there's some funny, funny stuff. But then afterward, the other stuff that people talk about is pretty much what you're looking at here. So feel free, you can do it on your own if you want to, read through it real quick. Because some of them are really like hysterical, what they write about what engineers are. Um, but for the most part, even, even the ones that are jokes still talk about the fact that it's somebody who's going to be doing a lot of work applying math and science. All right. Yeah, some are inappropriate, so you can keep those to yourself, but some are really funny also. Okay. All right. So let's talk about, in your text, you talk about, in your read about, rather, some characteristics. Okay, some characteristics of engineering. So what does the term optimization mean? We're going to use that a lot this year. What does it mean to you if I said, you know what? You really need to optimize the situation better. What do you think I mean by optimization? Optimization. Yeah. 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 More efficient. Okay. Yeah. Well, more efficient. Like small amount of stuff that you can Yeah. Resources. Yeah. Using a minimal amount of resources. So Victoria gives an example of how you optimize. You minimize resources. Good. What else? What are some other examples like Victoria gave of minimization and maximization? What might you want to maximize as an engineer? Pick up with this on Friday. What? Profit. Good one. Profit. We'll talk about this on Friday. So, I'm going to put up the next reading assignment under homework. Make sure you do it for Friday. Two quizzes on Friday. One based on the first reading, one based on the second. Be ready for them, please. At the end of maybe, what was it, two, three classes ago when we finished up, are we on this? We quickly talked about optimization. Can somebody maybe reiterate the concept of optimization? What are you trying to do when you optimize some sort of a process? Right? Use the best efficiency for the most cost. Yeah. So in, in you know, the 21st century, it's exactly right. The best efficiency and you want low cost. Um, I'm starting a project this year, actually. I didn't do it with you guys, actually. I wish I had. Somebody came up with the idea. Uh, in the first quarter, the students are going to be given, if you look in the corner, Johnny, you actually can hold it up. There's a piece of plywood back there. and they're going to use that piece of plywood as a ramp. And their goal is to create an object of minimal cost that can make it down the ramp in exactly one minute. Which is a lot harder than you think. Because if you put something on there, generally, and they can change the angle. The angle's adjustable. Generally, you think it would probably slide down pretty quick or it wouldn't move at all. So it's a kind of a difficult project to think outside the box. But the goal is to minimize the cost. Kind of like what Ryan was talking about. Um, now, before the 21st century, before everything was about cost and saving money, what were probably some of the other things that people looked to do with optimization? For example, maybe like, think about farmers. What would farmers, what would, they, what would their goals be on a daily basis? What would a farmer want to do? Um, maybe like get the most, or the easiest way, get the most done. Okay. okay, that's kind of like what we just said, so 
from the easiest way and the most crops or the most like uh, yield for the for the season. What else might they look for? Think about a farmer. You're on your farm all by yourself, or maybe with just your family. How are you able to operate stuff? What are they looking to create? Think back before, like you know, when when horses used to plow fields, and then suddenly they came out with other things. Like um, no, user friendly is the wrong word. I guess like it's it's a user friendly thing. I get what you're saying. Like uh, more like more crop less time. Or, like more. More crop in a more efficient manner, okay. So what are they looking to invent or do? Would be like self-sufficient, is that the right word I'm thinking? Yeah, they want to become self-sufficient, they want to, they want to have to worry about others to help with the farm. So they maybe invent some new devices that help them to maximize their output. So at the end of the season, they're able to come out with the most amount of crops, but they didn't have to spend too too much money to do it and the amount of labor that would be needed. Uh, so when we're talking about optimization, if you go on and take count of this, you're going to talk about minimization and maximization, those two topics. And we ended last class with that, and somebody said, we want to maximize, in, in this you know, world, maximize profit, minimize cost, or minimize labor, or minimize time. Time is one of your most difficult resources to balance. Um, so when we talk about optimization engineering, there's many different facets. It's not just one thing. How about constraints? Think about constraints and consider the a term of optimization again. What are constraints when it comes to some sort of a business plan, or some sort of a, um, John? Say again? Within a budget, okay, so monetary constraints, all right, economically. Like, like constraint for the object, like you can't go too cheap, that it won't work. Exactly, you have to consider failure, right? So you have constraints that are geometrical or structural constraints when it comes to the building or devising some sort of an apparatus. What other constraints do you have? The biggest constraint of all that I mentioned a minute ago. Time. Time. Good job. Time. Um, when I was, let's see, when I was in like 11th grade, my, my dad knew that I liked math and science. So he's like, I saw this lecture where this lecture is going to be given. It's at some hotel. If you want to go with me, I thought we'd go and just listen. And I was like, what? And my dad had never done this before. So I was, I was actually intrigued. And I asked him, like, what is this about? He said, well, I don't want to tell you, but I read all about it. I think it's right around. So I went there. It was like an hour lecture. In the beginning, I was sitting there and I'm like, oh, this is going to be heck. This is terrible. What am I doing here? It was actually awesome. It was all about how time is the number one resource that people don't have available to them or want more availability. Because if you think about it, if you have more time, well, then your costs can go down. If you have more time, then you've got more people working on a job. So time really is the biggest constraint the resource that we're always looking to use. Money, yes. Uh, even, even things like renewable energy or energy in general. With new technology, we're starting to realize that energy doesn't need to be based on fossil fuels, it can be renewable. So that's not probably as big of a lacking resource as time is right now. And think about things like time for issues of global warming. Time is a big resource there. Because suddenly, in a few years, in 10 years, in 20 years, we're going to see these elevating temperatures. We have to concern ourselves with that. So really, time is one of our biggest things. So constraints are anything that limit your production, or anything that limit the... Um, Manufacturing process, really, if we're considering, you know, products. Maybe services are different. How about modeling? You think back to physics last year. What would it mean to model something? We did a lot of modeling of things. We talked about forces. So the simple way that Dirks is saying is to take a look at small scale and extrapolate that. Now, how might you do that, John? What's one example of a way to create a small scale of a bridge that you can test? Uh, I don't know, I mean, you can physically make it, but what's another way to do it that would save you a lot of money? Probably you can figure out what the map or the trigger. You, you can look at like a trust analysis, that's one way to do it for short. You could do some sort of computer design of it, and you could do a computer analysis using a finite element program. Yeah, I was just going to say a computer program. Ah, yeah, it's a computer program. Uh, Victoria was also alluding to like 3D printing. You could 3D print things, we know, that you could then test. Now, obviously, if you 3D print something out of uh, a different material, it's not going to behave the same way that the bridge itself would, but you want to make something that's analogous in nature, right? So you can take a small scale production 
and really extrapolate that and see what would happen for a, a larger scale analysis. Now, you have to also consider the fact that models have constraints to them. So building a model of something is not necessarily going to be 100% accurate unless you have a program on a computer that's able to replicate exactly what you're looking for or exactly what you're designing. So making a small scale physical design of something is not always the solution. Now, 15, 20 years ago, that was the only solution. Uh, computer aided design, like CAD programs, and there's a program we're going to use this year, in addition to Autodesk Inventor, that actually tests stress on different structures. So you're going to be able to design something in Inventor. Take it, import it to the program, apply a point load, or apply a distributed load, and see what happens as a result. So you're going to be able to model things so you don't have to build them and test them out and then realize, oh, you know what, this doesn't work. And now we're, you know, $50,000 behind our budget because we didn't test this properly. We didn't know what was going into it ahead of time. Okay? Um, how about the fourth part? Responsibility. Responsibility. Why is that going under this category of characteristics for engineering? Why would responsibility be one of the main things? Maybe uh, when you're a new engineer or something, you're kind of responsible for its, you know, effectiveness. And, uh, and you're, you know, it, it, if it's like a major project, it can affect the lives of a lot of people. You're responsible if anything bad happens that could negatively impact those people. That's exactly correct. Right. So responsibility in the, in the sense of you are responsible for the lives of many people that will be using this structure or utilizing this apparatus. Now, in engineering, we're going to talk this year about something called the factor of safety. And this is where you have balances. So you might want to optimize something and have the lowest cost, but if it's not safe, then it's not going to work, right? It needs to be something that actually works in real life. So you utilize things like factors of safety. And an example of factor of safety, when you go in an elevator, what does it usually say on the elevator when it comes to like some sort of safety? Think about what you're seeing with that. The maximum weight. Now, I probably should tell you this, but that's not the real maximum weight. You can pile a lot more people in there because it's a factor of safety. Now, is it safe to do that? Probably not. But engineers account for this. What if there's, for some reason, one day where a lot of people get on that elevator, and the elevator system that's a checking system that should, like, a light should go off. I was, I was in, I was, I was following the Mets this summer. So I was flying across the country following the Mets, and we were on an elevator, and every time more than three people got on, the weight limit would go off. So that elevator had a huge factor of safety, or it was a really old school elevator that really couldn't hold a lot of people. So we'd have to actually, if we got all the luggage, we had to actually get off and take the elevator, so we had to take the stand in hand. Um, but the factor of safety is what affects that. So we may say, like, you know what, this can hold no more than 300 pounds. It's a good chance it's a factor of safety of like 1.5 or 2. So in reality, it can hold part of like 450 or maybe 600 pounds. So your factor of safety is exactly what it sounds like. Your factor, like a multiplier, and you multiply that number by to actually see what it really could with sand. So what would happen if you like really went over the weight with the cord just like snap? It probably wouldn't because of the factor of safety that's built in, but if you go significantly beyond shore, it could. Yeah. I mean, I, I really don't think elevators, elevators factor of safety are probably like eight or nine actually, because of the fact that if they break, what happens? Yeah. So things that can have catastrophic results as a result of failure have huge factors of safety. Do you really think this desk has an enormous factor of safety? Probably not. Nobody plans to have more than maybe a person sitting on it or your iPad on it or a book on it or something like that. So this is not as big of a deal. But when you're looking at structures that affect lots of people or that can have outcomes that would cause death, then you're going to clearly see something where you know, the factor of safety might be 6, 7, 8, not one or two. What happens though, as you increase that factor of safety? What happens as a result? Say again? I can hear you. Your max capacity goes up too. Your max capacity goes up, okay. What else? It's a lot more expensive too. Because think about it. If the factor of safety goes up for this, it means you need more structurally sound material. Maybe instead of using, remember we talked about I beams the other day real quick? I drew that diagram of an I beam. Instead of using an I-beam, now maybe, now maybe you have to use a box beam. Or maybe you have to actually use a solid, rectangular, prismatic beam. Well, there's a lot more material suddenly, and a lot more cost. A lot more cost. 
And a lot of time when you have to build it back, as you see, it also requires, it also requires more labor. So you're paying a lot when it comes to labor. And have you realized that by now? If your parents ever complain about something, whether they're getting house renovations, and they're like, oh, you know what? The material costs are nothing, but the labor is where it's all at. And that's true. A lot of the time, material costs can be minimized very easily. But labor is the part that you have to really consider when you're having some sort of a production. Okay? All right. Look now at the four different branches of engineering. Okay, now these are the four branches that were historically the four branches. Now, obviously, there are many subsets. For example, I studied mechanical engineering. And when I was studying in grad school, I actually was in controls and systems. So what we worked in was like feedback loops. Uh, and an example of that, I gave this example last year, I think, in physics to you guys. A feedback loop would be something like uh, cruise control in a car or the autopilot on a plane. I mean, a gust of wind comes by, and the pilot is not doing this at all. The pilot's sitting there, relaxing, waiting to land. What does the pilot have to worry about when you're in like severe turbulence? But if there's a small deviation in the pitch of the plane, the flap adjusts itself, and the plane readjusts. That's what happens. But it happens at a scale that's so fast, it's on what's called the feedback loop. A computer system is able to calculate that change in angle using most likely something like a dynamometer or a gyroscope, which senses the angle of the plane. It adjusts the flap on one side, which recalibrates the plane, but it does it in like a millionth of a second. So when you're on a plane, you know those little, like little uh, it's minor turbulence you feel sometimes? The only reason it's minor is because the feedback system in the plane is correcting over and over again. So I'm talking about mechanical right now. So within mechanical, there are so many subsets. Um, let's see, Schulte from last year, Henry. He wants to study aviation engineering or like aeronautical engineering, another subset of mechanical. So mechanical is start with, because I have to know the most about it talking about it. Mechanical, when we look at, we're talking specifically about things that involve moving parts. Almost all the time when you deal with mechanical engineers, you have moving parts. Um, one of the big things about civil we'll talk about, not only being for like uh, public service, but civil has a tendency to be static, whereas mechanical is dynamic, meaning moving parts versus stationary parts. Uh, now, obviously, engineers have to work within or uh, interdisciplinary all the time. So, for example, think about a bridge. Is a bridge meant to move? Yes. Good. Trick question. Very good, Ryan. Why is it meant to move? If it wasn't meant to move, what would happen? Okay, it might fall over. It would be more, more dramatic. What would happen like part of it? What could happen if it wasn't allowable? If it wasn't some room for deviation, some vibration on the bridge, what could happen? Yeah, the structure itself could fail at some point. It might not topple. I mean, Tacoma Narrows, we'll see later in this lesson, we'll talk about Tacoma Narrows. And that has to do with its, uh, its natural frequency. And we'll talk more about the fact that it wasn't necessarily structural, it was the conditions of the day itself. That was a really interesting one. Uh, but specifically, when we look at civil, we know that civil are things that are made not to move, like a building, like a bridge. But there is going to be some motion on a bridge in a building. And who was asking the question about the World Trade Center? We were talking about the World Trade Center and stability, oh, the, the Freedom Tower, I guess we'll say, and the stability of it. Um, so I'll post this article. I was looking at a new, I had an article from last year, I used to post your news form in physics, about this building in Japan that has uh, this unbelievable mass damper system in it. And it's pretty much a solid mass, a block, in the top part of the building that actually restrains its motion from side to side on crazy windy days when at that elevation the wind would cause this building to deviate a lot. And think about it for a second. I draw you a quick diagram. If you've got a building like this, okay, and there's wind, and the wind is causing the building to vibrate, the top is going to vibrate the most. So a small angle of change in the bottom causes a large deviation at the top. The bottom might only be vibrating back and forth very lightly. But the top deviates a lot more because this angle is propagated. It's a, lot, it's a lot more of an effect at the top of the building. So they actually have this mass damper system toward the top of the building. When there's more mass, if you think back to Newton's laws, it's difficult to move something with more mass because it's got more inertia. So as a result, it prevents the top from vibrating as much as it would. Uh, so we're looking at civil as things that are built for like a public service. So one of the, we're going to talk about history of engineering, too. One of the primary reasons for engineering was to better serve humanity. 
was to allow people to get from point A to point B in an easier path. Think about roads, even dirt roads. Even people going through the forest with a machete. I know that's weird, but clearing a path, you're creating a road. In a sense, it's a kind of engineering. Okay, because you're making a task simpler for humanity. So civil starts with that, whereas mechanical, a lot of mechanical really came from actually, what do you think? Anyone want to take a guess where mechanical really came from? With the civil, for sure. Definitely for help with civil, but other, another application of mechanical. <coughs> I think that's not very pleasant in the world today. Something that we hope goes away at all times. We're always striving for the world to have a world of what? Peace. Peace. So war. War was a huge part of mechanical engineering. Um, there's a movie, and I showed you a clip of it last year. I can't remember the name. With the catapult. Oh, yeah. the Kingdom of Heaven, is that right? Yeah. It was like a 30 second clip I showed you the catapult. The, the idea behind it was that, if you recall, remember there were markers along the way? There were these white markers every like 30 feet, and then there was a yellow marker. And the main character that was, I think, Orlando Bloom, yeah. knew that when the army got to the white marker, launched this catapult. When it got to the yellow marker, launched the next catapult, because they knew the trajectory of the catapult itself. So, as a result, mechanical engineering stemmed from a lot of war. Uh, what, about, what about chemical? Where do you think chemical came about? Chemical. Probably Okay, chemical warfare is one. Good, what else? I heard one over here. Food, absolutely food. What else? Medicine. Medicine, for sure. Pharmaceutical in general. Those are the three main things. Now, other things you wouldn't imagine. The shirt you're wearing. All this new dry fit material and stuff, that wouldn't exist without some sort of chemical engineering that's been researched. Okay, so a lot of materials, material science, materials engineering, comes as a result of chemical engineering. Now, the last part, electrical engineering, that also encompasses what? What do you think electrical engineering also encompasses? That's probably the most prominent engineering in today now. In college, we call them ECEs. What do you think ECE stands for? <laughs> not circuit, but that's close. Not electrical circuit engineer. Well, you could have an electrical chemical. You could, but that's not it. <laughs> Computer engineer? Oh. So some people, some people might major in computer engineering nowadays, but not electrical. But a lot of colleges branch electrical and computer together. After about a year of school, those students decide they're going to become electrical engineers. Maybe work working specifically in hardware. Are they going to become computer engineers working mainly in software? Or maybe they do a little bit of both. Okay, so those are the four main branches that have subsets from those that branch off. Okay, let's take a look at that Pat of Canal video. Okay, and it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool apparatus we're going to see. Let's take a look at the uh, history of engineering. We're going to go through several different categories first. Okay, first. Anything in the beginning of time that served as a tool, as a, as, a, as a way to make life easier, is really the first exhibit of engineering. There really isn't any, any way to say, well, this was the first engineer that ever lived, or this was the first application of engineering ever. It's impossible to do that. Okay, so really, when you think about the history of engineering, any simple tool, even when you think back to like when people originally started like making fires, the first time they made a fire, it's combustion. That's engineering, really. Okay, you're taking oxygen, you're taking some sort of a spark, you're igniting it with a fuel source that is engineering in a sense. So the history of engineering go back to whenever you kind of think it started. Uh, but specifically, if we look at things, um, military, the word engineer itself literally meant somebody who worked on military engineer or engines themselves. So the first term of engineer did not specifically mean someone who was helping humanity or veteran society and these things, and then someone who's working on an engine, on a military engine specifically. Um, when I was in high school, and this is, you know, I would say in the last 10 years, engineering has blown up a lot more in the United States because we've recognized the need for American engineers and not as many foreign engineers. Uh, a lot of jobs in the U.S. are lost to a lot of foreigns, foreigners that come into the U.S. that end up taking engineering jobs. It's the truth, though. So when I was in high school, 
I remember meeting with my guidance counselor, and he was telling me, this is how I found out about Villanova. He was telling me his son went to Villanova, and he was studying engineering. I was like, oh, it's interesting. I was wondering, why the hell is this guy telling me this? Like, I, I like math and science, but I don't want to work on a train. So, this is the truth. So I had no idea. I thought engineering meant you work on a train. Yeah. Uh, because train engineers are still called engineers, but it's just a different type. And it wasn't until like maybe the like, second quarter of my senior year when I was starting to look into where I really wanted to go that my physics teacher, I was an AP physics, and my teacher, he was like, listen, I think you'd really be good at engineering. And I was like, why do people keep telling me that? And he explained to me that engineering was not engineering like on a train. But in this military sense, it literally meant an engineer, one who works on an engine. So that's where the military definition itself came from. Um, let's see, mechanically, some of, the main, some of the major first known engineers, one of the major first engineers known was Archimedes. Uh, Archimedes, obviously you guys know a lot about him, but he came up with a lot of different devices. Uh, gearing systems. What else? I wrote down a bunch of these. Gearing systems. Um, he helped with the industrial revolution for trains. All of his uh, original work with mass production. Let's see. Yeah, that was the major stuff that he did. Uh, why are gearing systems so important? Let's quickly take a minute to talk about that. We're going to talk about gears at some point this year, but why are gears such a big deal? What does a gear do? Can anybody actually tell me what a gear does? Changes. Changes. It's actually not that easy to describe exactly what a gear does. First? Well, it's not. Well, That's an example of what gears do. Absolutely. Generally speaking, that's, you're right, it's exactly it. It's an example of what a gear does. You mean, generally speaking, what are gears made to do? A part that rotates in order to move a lot of other parts. Okay. Like, you can move, another example, you move a whole engine of parts through one. What I was saying. Yeah. So, a rotating part that moves other things, usually, you take something rotational and convert it to linear motion. Yeah. So, think about your car. The axle itself rotates, yet you are moving linearly, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So you're taking some sort of rotary motion using a gear, and you know that when you change your, uh, is it or gear? So you change speed, like five, like five speed. Yeah, you you should gears at 25, you should gears, like, you what? What are you doing when you're shifting gears? Anyone know? Physically? You're shifting how it flows the each piston is. Like, not really, it's like... More, more specific with the gears are saying. Stick to the gear you're sticking to a new, you're shifting up to a different set of gears. What about those gears? You know, you know about? Farther or closer away to the... Close? Uh, okay. bigger. The size. size. So the size of the gear changes how much either torque or velocity you get out of it. So think about it. What happens? Anybody drive a manual here? Anyone know how to drive a stick? Oh, awesome. You should definitely learn when you're over. I never learned. I drove across country with somebody, though, in a manual, so I had to learn when I was driving. I guess I got stuck at Easy Pass and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, shift into first. And we had to do a quick Chinese flag trip. Everybody was beating. It was terrible. Learn how to drive a stick earlier in life. So when you change gears, what you're doing is you're changing the size of the gear. So when you're driving in first, in first speed or first gear, whatever you want to call it, your, your car can only go up to a certain velocity, right? And then suddenly you start to hear the RPMs go up a lot. And when you're changing the second gear, what are you doing? You're allowing the car to undertake a higher velocity, and you're changing the amount of torque that's on the actual axle. If you don't do that, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're going to stall or you're going to ruin your engine, really. I don't know specifically what would happen, but you might, you'll probably stall if you don't change your gears at the right time, or you don't change it properly with your, with your, uh, what's the term? Clutch. Thank you, clutch. Uh, clutch, all clutch does is it disengages the original gear, and it re-engages the other gear. Okay, but you have to do it, and for those that drive a stick, you have to do it in a timely fashion so that the clutch doesn't grind against the gear teeth. Have you ever done that before? When you're learning how to drive a stick, those before you got to get there. When you're learning how to drive a stick, did you ever hear that, like, that grinding of gears when you didn't change, when you didn't, uh, change speeds properly? Because the, the clutch and the, the gear train is not engaging properly. So the teeth are running yeah, against it. The clutch and then the gears, like, the clutch separates the gear and then it up. Yep, that's exactly it. So the clutch just disengages it every time. Um, let's take a quick look at civil engineering. Uh, one of the first known engineers had to do with the pyramids. Take back to the pyramids, still. I mean, such a feat. We're going to talk specifically about pyramids, but 
the amount of mass that was moved by the manpower that was involved in really the slaves it was not manpower at that point. I mean, it was manpower, but people at that point in life didn't even consider people like human beings. It was terrible. That was like their machine, if you think about it. It was impossible to move this on. They don't know even how it's done today. People still suspect how it's done. There are many ideas having to do with like heavy roller systems. But these giant blocks of rock were moved hundreds of kilometers. So civil engineering, when you think back to like the first civil engineering, we go back to you know, uh, the, the pyramids and the, the pharaohs. Now, one of the first known that's like the, the father of engineering was known as John Smeaton, his name was. He was an English civil engineer who was designing bridges, canals, harbors, lighthouses. Uh, and he specifically started using this stuff called hydraulic line. And it was a big change in the world. Because prior to this, they couldn't have your know, mortars, like concrete that's used to put in between the bricks and stuff, brick and mortar. They couldn't do anything under water. Mortar and stuff that would solidify and hold your structure together wasn't working under water. So this guy, John Smeen, came up with this idea and said, let's use this, this limestone, and this would work under water, it would set under water, which enabled them to build more bridges more canals, uh, things like dams that wouldn't be ruined by the water that was constantly uh, in contact with it. Let's see. Uh, electrical. Uh, and there's a lot of them. The first considered an electrical engineer was William Gilbert. And he's the one who, told, who, who came up with the idea or the term of electricity. Uh, let's see. Other famous ones that we've talked about that you've heard from uh, physics. Remember, like the term volts came out of voltage. Okay, that was Alessandro Volta, um, like Faraday. So there's a lot of different things that are term Faraday blank. You hear different apparatus came from like Faraday inventions. Um, Maxwell. We'll talk about Edison at some point. Yeah, yeah, he's later on. Um, and then chemical engineering specifically came as a result of the Industrial Revolution. When mass production started occurring, when more mechanical processes were easily done, they needed chemical engineering. Why? Think about byproducts of mechanical engineering. All the waste, all the runoff, all that kind of stuff. They needed chemical engineers to understand what would happen if they take this stuff and just dump it into the environment, right? What's going to happen as a result? Or can humans come in contact with things that we put on food to preserve the food? Why or why not? Chemical engineering. Okay, so chemical engineering really came as a result of the Industrial Revolution in uh, the late 1800s. I would make 15 exact same problems. Genetic engineering, yeah. Which is a, a branch of that. All right, let's stop here for today. All right, so let's start first with, what is it, Tesla? Yeah. Okay, so who's heard of Tesla, first of all? I feel like lately everyone's heard of Tesla, right? Because of the Tesla car. Um, now... What's the most recent thing that's been put out by Tesla? Forget history for a second. Just think about news. Anyone actually follow tech news lately? What's the new Tesla? <laughs> the charging station. The what? The charging station. Yeah, so what are they called? They call them the Tesla batteries or Tesla, whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah. So they're at home, though. So, oh, this is a different thing. I was talking about where you drive on. Oh, yeah, they're in a car. <laughs> so he's talking about for Tesla, Tesla motors like electric cars for replacing the battery and getting quick charge. Anyone heard of the new stuff though with Tesla? It's, it's huge. It's like the biggest thing out there. But that's the thing. Exactly. So, recently Tesla came out with this new at home like grid of power source. So it wouldn't have to be charged until like every like three years. So you're off the grid completely. So people, imagine you're living somewhere up in northern Michigan or up in Canada where maybe you're in the middle of like in a forest where there's no uh, electrical lines whatsoever. For a long time, you'd have to like figure out a way to live without electricity. A lot of people did. But Tesla just came out with this new battery that's apparently able to last up like two or three years for an entire house. For two or three years. And it's huge. The battery itself is literally like this big. And it'd be mounted, it's flat. It'd be mounted like on a wall in your house and hidden behind the wall so that it's not exposed. But every few years, that battery would have to be replaced or recharged. But the, the biggest part about it is that there's no monitoring anymore now. Think about it. 
How do people know, or how does the government know, how do all these like, spy agencies know where people are? A lot of the time, they look at electrical signals. What do you think, like, for a long time, you know, before pot was legalized in, Cal in Colorado and Washington, you know how they actually, but no, seriously, you know how they actually knew people were growing? How did they know people were growing for a long time? How were they able to, like, find, like, grow houses and actually get this? Well, they could see that, too, yes. So I'm talking about the uh, hydroponic at home in houses, not, not fields. How did they know? Seriously. Was it, like, the heat or something? No, I know. It was a lot of electrical. Yeah, so you're on the grid. So before being off the grid, the electrical current that was going into your house, the amount of voltage, the amount of energy, the amount of really kilowatt hours, which is energy, could be measured. Listen, please. It could be measured any time based on high levels of energy usage. They knew where certain things were occurring. This is not that was just an example because before that happened, it was like a big thing. Now with this new Tesla battery and stuff. People that want to live on their own somewhere in the wilderness that don't want to be like, you know, annoyed by whether it's a government agency, whether it's like they want to like, just they don't want to have, maybe they don't want to be a U.S. citizen anymore. They want to move somewhere away to an island, and that <laughs> island has no electricity. Well, the whole idea of the Tesla battery now is amazing. And the big thing is that countries, third world countries specifically, they don't have the infrastructure for electrical lines, they don't have it existing, they can't have any sort of electrical energy. So a lot of the time, what they end up using are rechargeable things. So you'll see things like there's been a soccer ball that's been invented that charges energy. <laughs> and play with it. Anyone seen that before? Exists. Yeah, it moves. It makes it. There's a little, there's a little rotating magnetic field, and it's an AC current, which was invented by Tesla also. And it's the way the ball moves induces an electrical current, which charges the battery inside the ball. And then when the kid goes home, this is I'm talking about third world countries. When the kid goes home, what do they do? On the side of the wall, there's actually an outlet. You plug into that outlet, and you could use that soccer ball you play with all day to now power like two or three lights all night in your house. Part of that, these people had no lights. There was no infrastructure for electricity. Well, the Tesla battery is a huge, huge innovation in this field because now these can be used in other countries where the infrastructure for electrical lines is not possible. Maybe there aren't roadways to actually physically have that. Maybe there's a lot of issues with you know, a lot of countries that have um, mudslides and literally geographic portions of their country cannot hold electrical infrastructure. They can't have electrical lines. Well, these batteries are huge advances. John, I'm sorry, Andy. Yeah, how much are these batteries going to cost? I don't know. I'm really not sure. Can you Google it real quick? <coughs> Just type in Tesla battery cost or Tesla battery usage. It'll definitely pop up as a... Doesn't so 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 uh, Tesla, like, right now, like, 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 it's very possible that there may be not even a lot of air It's very possible, yeah. Well, you know why that is? Why is that, obviously? Well, they cost so much money. It, the, the innovation, R&D for anything costs a lot of money. So when you start building something, like even Kickstarter, even all these people that put up these ideas, you never make money in the beginning. Because you have to pay for all the research and design. You have to pay those scientists that came up with all this stuff. Once it starts running, once it's up and running, and people are buying it more, and you don't need any more research, and they're just manufacturing at this point, they can cut down the cost of manufacturing a lot by finding another way of mass producing them or some sort of you know, outsourcing that they usually do, and they also have no expenses for research and design. So then you have like, and really what you're looking at is your cost to revenue function. Your cost function starts out huge. Your revenue function starts out lower. But the revenue function eventually will meet up with the cost function. And when it does, you're at a state of equilibrium. That's when you have a cost, what is it called? Cost revenue equilibrium or something where you pretty much profit is at zero at that point finally. You're no longer in what's it called when you're making when you're negative? In the microsoft. Like in the red. So you're no longer in that territory. Now you have zero profit, but you at least come to any point of equilibrium. From that point on, the revenue outgrows the cost function and you start to make profit as that gap expands. Um, so when I was at Nova, I used to tutor the two or three kids that were in the business school and economics and different things that were involved in math. And this was one of the things that we studied, looking at functions. So when you learn about graphs and functions in your math class, it's not just to study graphs. It's because depending on whatever major you do, you have to be able to understand how to visualize stuff. So what Peter asked about them not making money is definitely true right now. Because they're in a time period where they're going to lose money for a while until they reach that point where they actually have some sort of equilibrium in their, 
you know, their revenue and their cost functions, and then eventually one supersedes the other, hopefully that being revenue. Johnny, what did you find out about cost of one of these uh, batteries? It's going to cost between 3000 and 4000 Did you see how long it's going to last? Did it save any chance? Um, I think it was upwards of one or two years at least, I think. It says it's going to cost $350 per kilowatt hour in energy storage. So. $350 per kilowatt hour? I'm curious though, yeah, how long it stays, it holds its charge. Well, it depends on how long, it's on, it depends on the average, how much you're using, I guess, really, yeah. Because if you're only lighting a light bulb every night, right, then the battery might last you 10 years. But if you're running like a computer and you're running all this stuff off the test, the battery, yeah, then it's going to last you. Yeah. It'll definitely be depleted, I just don't, I'm wondering what the average lifespan they're giving for it. Anyhow, let's get back to Tesla. So, Tesla is really known primarily for the uh, invention or discovery, not invention, of alternating current. Okay, alternating current is what allows a lot of the current, well, all electricity in the US is alternating current. It runs AC. And you're going to see if you buy something that it says AC. Remember from last year, real quick, we talked about alternating current? It had to do with the fact that the nodes are switching. So, you know, you have a positive and a negative terminal. Those positive negative terminals are constantly switching. So instead of the flow of electricity being continuous, if you recall, I showed you a little image of it last year, the electrons are doing this. Back and forth in the circuit. They're literally moving back and forth, and they're getting recharged as a result of that. It's different from the direct current motion that was originally established. Um, one of the major things about AC current, it's a lot safer. It's a lot safer than having DC current. So if you're in a third world country, if you're in a place that doesn't have electrical infrastructure, a lot of the time you're still running on DC circuits. Okay, direct current. Um, let's see. All right. Let's go to Thomas Edison. So Edison is known, first of all, everybody knows for that light bulb, which is obvious. But the real thing about Edison is that he had over a thousand, a thousand different inventions in his lifetime. Over a thousand inventions. So Edison wasn't just known for the light bulb. Everybody seems to know him for that. Um, he was nicknamed, he was called like the Wizard. The Wizard of Menlo Park is where he's from, but they called him the Wizard because this guy literally invented so many things. He was a genius. Um, and let's see what else. He was famous for improving the design of the stock ticker that we see today. Uh, and the original telephone, two of the major things that he also improved. Um, they talk about Edison as being one of the hardest working scientists and engineers because he literally worked around the clock to come up with this many things. And he's known for a quote saying that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I Meaning, you gotta work hard. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If you're not willing to put in the work, you're not gonna do anything in your life. Uh, this next guy, Reginald, um, he was specifically known, specifically the father of wireless communication. So without this guy's breakthroughs in wireless technology, we might be 10 to 15 years behind in wireless technology today. Think about how much stuff is wireless. Almost everything nowadays is. Almost everything. You charge your phone now. You charge by induction. You put it on the see those little, you know what I'm talking about? Little charge pads. You drop your phone on it and it charges the battery by inducing a field around it. There's not even a wire connecting that and you can still charge your phone. It's amazing to think about that. You're transferring energy via some wireless method. Um, he was also the, let's see, the guy who first enabled radio broadcast, and this was in 1906, in 1906, speech and music was transmitted because of his research that he did at the University of Pittsburgh. So he's known for wireless communications. I'm just giving you a few examples, by the way. This third, or let's see, fourth one now, Grace Murray Hopper. Grace Murray Hopper, the thing that she's known for, and this is kind of interesting, she was working uh, at the U.S. Navy, and she developed this computer program. And whatever the program was, not really important. But what's interesting was that while working in this program, she noticed that the computer itself kept malfunctioning. And it turned out it had to do with, there was an infestation of moths, and the moths had gotten into the computer, and it caused the computer to not run properly which turned the first bug. Have you ever a computer bug before? She was known as the person who turned that. So the idea of what happens to a computer, not really a bug, obviously, because the mall is what caused the computer to malfunction, 
you have the time about computer bugs or debugging some sort of code. So if you're into computer programming and you hear about debugging, it means getting rid of errors in your computer code. And it came about because of a very smart algorithm. Goddard, who's heard of Goddard before? No one's heard of Goddard before? Even the name, forget his whole name, but the term Goddard or the name Goddard, where have you heard that before? <laughs> Okay. Which one? Where? Jimmy Neutron? I didn't know it's Jimmy Neutron. Where is God? Jimmy Neutron. No one's heard of God. No one's heard of God at Space Station? Ever? Yeah. No, it's clear. Okay. So, God at Space Station is like, it's like one of the biggest space stations funded by NASA in, uh, it's in DC. Um, when I taught at DC, I actually took my whole class down a trip because one of my friends that I, used to go to grad school with, he's a thermal engineer working at Goddard, actually. So I brought the whole class there. They had, they had this, like, uh, it's actually really cool. They had this open house for the entire Goddard space station. So you could see everything, get, like, lessons on what they do there. It was actually really, really cool. And they did a lot of really interesting science experiments while there. If you're ever on the way out to, like, Baltimore or D.C. area, you should seriously consider trying to get, like, a tour of Goddard space station. It's not going to be open for too much longer with NASA funding being cut so much. So it's one of those things that before it you know, no, longer, no longer exists, you should. Anyway, Goddard, uh, Robert Goddard, he is the pioneer of rocketry. Prior to what Goddard discovered and researched, rocket science was like this field of engineering that didn't even exist. He pretty much invented his own entire science and engineering field called rocket science. And a long time ago, people that were rocket scientists were thought of to be like the smartest of engineers because no one understood how you could get a rocket into space. No one understood space exploration. So the smartest of the smart engineers were the ones working on that. The, the, the space race that we had with Russia um, for a long time there, that was all about really just proving who was smarter. That's all it was, to see who could get to the moon first. Um, so the big thing that Goddard discovered, and this is huge, was that rockets, even in a vacuum of space, could produce thrust force. And that was the big problem that they were coming up with. That prior to Goddard, they thought that by firing a rocket in space, it wouldn't be able to work because there wouldn't be combustion. You would need oxygen, and since there's no oxygen in space, you couldn't have combustion. So he came up with what was called the solid rocket fuel. And the solid rocket fuel was able to burn even when there was no oxygen and you were in an empty medium like space. So that was his biggest contribution. Now, this also, this is where we have to talk about ethics in this class. Because engineering, there's so much ethics involved in engineering, and you're going to learn about this if you go on to take any engineering courses in college. This led to things like rocket launchers, bazookas, things like tanks that shot rockets. So although it had a lot of positive impact, it also had a ton of negative impact. World War II, all the rockets and bazookas and all that stuff that was introduced in World War II, it was really a result of Goddard's engineering and research that he did with rocketry. So, yes, things are great when you learn more about technology, but we're learning more and more about this stuff. I mean, how many people have seen Iron Man? Any of the three, really, it's kind of which one. But one of the big things in Iron Man, before he becomes like this philanthropist saving the earth, right? Tony Stark is this complete jerk, and he doesn't care where his stuff is being sold and what's happening. All this crazy technology is being sold to these rich, rich terrorists into some country. And that's eventually, obviously, in the movie you see where he gets captured and all that stuff happens. But he recognizes all the stuff that's happening. So, yes, engineering and advancements in technology is amazing, but in the wrong hands, in the hands of people who want to create devastation on the earth, it's really not a good thing, right? So Goddard, although was, you know, a great engineer, some of his discoveries didn't help us much. How about Bessemer? If you don't know Bessemer, I'm going to probably go downstairs right now and tell you, sir. Solving? You better know, right? You've heard of the Bessemer process, please? In this yeah. class? What's the Bessemer process? What's the whole idea behind it? Like steel. What was it? it steel pure. pure steel. What else? By injecting oxygen. Good. Well, what else about the process was so important? It was something else about it? It was quicker and, and mass produced. So, yes, in the end, it was cheaper also as a result. Um, so, the the uh, original guy that started with this process actually named William Kelly, and Bessler actually bought the patent from Kelly, and it was similar to the process that he improved on. 
And he then came up with the best work process. And we know that even today, it's still actually used. Uh, last but not least, Catherine Stinson. The reason I put Catherine Stinson here, she was the first female graduate of the of a College of Engineering. She was initially denied admission, actually. <coughs> Um, she graduated as the vice president of her class. She was hired by Civil Group, became the first female engineer at Civil Aeronautics Administration, and then she ended up founding the Society for Women's Engineer for uh, Women Engineers, which, if you've gone to school for engineering, you know I knew when I was there. It's a huge, huge engineering um, feat because prior to you know the age when she was in college, women were not really known as engineers, even like scientists nowadays. We see more and more that you're seeing that there's at least you know 25 to 50 percent of engineers are now being women, not just men. And the whole concept of it didn't make sense for a long time. It was more of this stupid mentality that we had of you know that women were doing one job and men were doing another. In reality, but obviously you know men today are doing a lot of jobs that women did in the past, and women today are doing a lot of jobs that men did in the past. And there's really not a role as to what you can do. Sure, things like sports are still going to be segregated because of obviously physical nature of the, the actual you know, job as, a, as an athlete. But things like jobs in engineers and stuff, and you'll see like a lot of men now that are chefs and cooks, right? And like the 40s, you know, a lot of them would stay home and cook dinner. And it was like what they did and raise the kids. Now it's the reverse sometimes. Um, for example, my, my brother, my brother is a newborn, he's staying home a lot with me. Whereas his his wife is doing a lot of work, and then you know for some reason they do the other part time job. So things have changed, but this is a huge advancement in engineering because prior to it there were literally no female engineers. So it's a very important <laughs> thing to remember. What? Uncle Mark. Uncle Mark, yes. Um, I always tell you. Guys. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at some uh, some accomplishments of engineering, some engineering feats. Okay, first let's take a look at the aqueducts of Segovia. So, I happened to actually visit Segovia recently, and it was pretty amazing when I actually went to see this, because I had thought about this last year, but I never knew physically what it looked like. So, first of all, anybody know how aqueducts work? Well, they use gravity. They use gravity. It's the whole idea of an aqueduct. It uses gravity. It's all energy that occurs on the Earth. It's not using any mechanical energy whatsoever. So, the aqueducts of Segovia start at some distance really, really far from Segovia. And what happens in the time, or in the, in the, in the distance, from that location to Segovia? Like, how does the water travel, literally? Like it's what? Like it down. I'm not concave, but... <laughs> like it's it's on a slope. Yeah. You're getting concave down. Concave down, it would be like this. That's what concave down is. No. So it has a negative slope. It has a, a, a gradual slope. And here's the interesting part. Because the water travels over such a long distance, the smallest amount of slope causes the water to run. So the graduation is like one degree, literally one degree of slope. So we're talking about not a perfectly flat horizontal pipe, but a pipe that literally just goes like that. That's it. A small graduation. But over a long, long distance, it can build up a lot of pressure behind it, so it allows the water to flow. Uh, this is the way that the entire city was provided with the means of water um, for a long time. Let's see what it was, actually. Is there a date in here? I jotted down a bunch of stuff. Is there a date? Mm, no, I don't have a date here. It's terrible. But the distance the water travels is almost a half of a mile. The water travels almost a half of a mile before actually making it to the aqueducts where it's then you know, dispensed for <coughs> humans to use. What else has to happen along the way? That's really, really important for you to drink the water. Filtration. It has to be filtered. How do aqueducts work with filtration? Say again? Okay, but that back in that day, was there a filter? Like, did they have filters? Did they have yeah, filters? Yeah, yeah. Metal grates. Not even metal grates. No. I mean, they had that to get, sure, maybe they had big rocks, definitely. But what did they do? Big rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it, guys. How do if you every, everybody drink Polo Spring water, right? Yes. What's the theme of Polo Spring? Yes. Spring. 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 Spring
from main, right? Comes up from main there? Whoa. No, is that where it goes from? Is that where it goes? It's where it goes from. Hey, the idea is that as the water goes from lower level to lower level, there's a natural filtration system built into the earth that cleans the water. So when you get that water out of the spring, it's natural. It doesn't even have to be filtered. If there's maybe like big sediments in it, maybe they take it out. But the actual water itself, like any sort of bacteria, is naturally filtered. That happens with these aqueducts as well. Okay, the natural filtra filtration systems that exist that they have set up. Um, it's called decanting, I think is the term. Decanting. Where you take like, uh, where it separates like big pieces, then over a long term period, smaller and smaller and smaller and finer and finer and finer pieces of sediment settle out. All right, let's take a look at the. We talked quickly the other day about pyramids, so we won't spend too much time. Uh, let's go over some of the interesting facts about the pyramids, though. First, for a long time, this was known as one of the tall structures on Earth. Uh, there are over 2.3 million stone blocks used to create this. This is the Pyramid of Giza specifically. Uh, what's interesting is that the actual stone blocks themselves weigh anywhere between 25 and 80 tons. A ton is 2,000 pounds. So 80 tons, we're looking at 100 and what is that? 80 tons times 2,000, 160,000 or 16,000? 160,000, 8 times 2 is 160,000 pounds for some of these giant stone blocks. Now, not all of them were that size, but some of them were smaller. But what's crazy is that they were actually transported from a location that was 800 kilometers away. How far is 800 kilometers? They did, they used to, yeah. It didn't matter. But it did matter, even with that, even, even with manpower and having slavery at the time, it was an unbelievable feat to get this to be moved. So to this day, they still don't physically know how a lot of this stuff was moved. Some theories are out there. Theories that they would use like rollers in the sand they would set up over certain distances so the object would be taking a roll and a wheel. Another theory was that they actually used a lot of natural lubrications in order to enable the stone, <laughs> the stone blocks to move at a certain rate. <laughs> The, the uh, let's see, they used over 500,000 tons of mortar. What's mortar? Yeah, like cement. Okay. Uh, over 5.5 million tons of limestone. It's just unbelievable to think about how, how large of a pyramid this is. Has anyone ever visited the pyramids? I haven't even. All right, next. I saw a video the other day about the Panama Canal. Some interesting things. First of all, it took 42,000 workers to build the Panama Canal. 42,000. They actually finished it on time. They actually finished it a little bit early. Here's what's interesting. The amount of land that they had to like literally shovel or dredge is the word, blast through all this stuff, is enough, ready? Enough earth and rubble to cover the head with 12 feet of rubble on top of it. Imagine the entire island of Manhattan covered with 12 feet of rubble and rock and stone and all this. That's how much earth was removed just to build the Panama Canal. Now, the question is, what did they do a lot of this? Well, they realized afterward, they realized that they were going to have this problem with the levels of the, of the, uh, of the sea that are going to be changing. They could change up to 25 feet in a single day with this monsoon season. So they took a lot of this earth and created a dam. And at this time, it was a dam that made what's like the first man-made lake. This lake would fill up with water, and then what would happen is every time that the, uh, the Panama Canal is used, it's over, what is it, 52 million gallons of water that's being lost every time that it's raised and lowered. So that dam keeps filling up, or the lake keeps filling up from the dam, and it keeps utilizing that water over and over again. Another fun fact, if you build a tunnel to the center of the earth, 16 feet in diameter, that's how much land was excavated during the Panama Canal building. So literally, the amount of land that was dredged up to make the Panama Canal, a tunnel to the center of the earth, 16 feet in diameter, would be that much land. It's an amazing feat to think about this. Um, and this was done, again, with only 42,000 workers. That's actually a small amount of workers compared to today. All right. Uh, let's see, let's see. 
Great Wall of China. What are some things you know about the Great Wall? You, you studied and heard about the Great Wall of China. Obviously. You know any facts about the Great Wall? Some people visited the Great Wall a few years back. Right? China. They used to bury uh, people that died building it. Yeah, some people that died in the process of building it, instead of burying the people in the ground, they would use them as actual structure for the wall. It's actually a true fact. Alessia? 5,000 miles long. 5,000 miles long. I didn't even know that. I almost knew I didn't write it down. You were there, weren't you? Yeah, I remember you were there. What up? Guys, listen to It's not continuous. It is not continuous. That's one fun fact a lot of people don't know. It is not continuous, but uh, one concept was used, and they built a lot of the structures that were on hilltops. A lot of the wall was built on hilltops. Why? Overlooked. Exactly. Vantage points. Okay, it was used for military structure. What else do you know about it? Tell us, because you were there. I'd love to hear more. You can see it. It's the only man-made structure you can see in space. Okay. And that's, I think, what you mean is from an airplane. From an airplane. Yes. Not maybe from like the moon or something, but from from, uh, from an airplane, you can definitely see the actual uh, curvature or the whatever the path of the Great Wall. What else do you know about the Great Wall? I see my house in the my plane can fly in the air. Can you really? Yeah, I keep my building. Really? I live right there. Is the difference between seeing a structure versus seeing know, something distinguished? What other facts? Let's see. No, no, no. no. You know, Volkswagen did an ad a few years ago where they, uh, where was Lexus, where they um, had like a bunch of cars in the desert and the salt clouds were flying and like they made up the design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like miles long so that the father of a little girl in space could see like something that she wrote to her dad. Like they use this. Look it up, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, let's see what else. Some facts about this. <laughs> All right. In some areas, in some areas of the wall, they ran out of cement. They didn't have enough to make cement. They didn't have the mortar to make concrete. Because you know, cement is not concrete. You know the difference? No. Cement is the actual like powder uh, material that you add water to. You make concrete. Concrete is involved with cement. Water and then like uh, little rocks, that's what concrete is. But cement, they ran out, so they ended up using, what do you think? Sticky rice, very good. <laughs> they use sticky rice. They use sticky rice and they use egg whites. Like, no joke, egg whites and sticky rice are part of the wall as mortar. Can I tell you how long it takes to braise the whole thing? I know. Alright, let's look at the next one. Look at the Hoover Dam. Okay, let's take a look at the Hoover Dam. First of all, take a look at the structure. Just visually look at it for a second, right? It's kind of unbelievable. All that water is being held behind this giant stone structure. Yet, any little hole in here could cause some catastrophic failure. And that's called propagation. You have a crack somewhere in the Hoover Dam, that could cause that crack to then spread further and further, causing a they go the entire portion of the dam to collapse. How is this possibly maintained? How is it possibly maintained? Some of the water comes through generator energy, absolutely, yeah. A lot of water comes through the dam. The Hoover Dam powers the, the towns nearby, absolutely. A lot of water, but a lot of water is held up, right? How is it physically held? Think about it. Is there's a lot has a lot to do with the distribution of the pressure for sure. Whose principal last year told us about distribution of pressure? <laughs> Not for new that was close though, it was the same time. <laughs> Remember when you wanted to squeeze the egg and it wouldn't crack? Who said it? Yeah, who said it? Who was it? Anybody remember? 
Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So Pascal's principle. Okay, the idea of distribution of pressure is utilized greatly here. You guys looked at it with an A. Imagine the idea of the concept of saying not breaking because the membrane is equal pressure. But now we're looking at the Hoover Dam. Other fun facts. Listen carefully. Um, let's see. God bless you. All right, ready? During, during its full efficiency, water flows through the turbine of the Hoover Dam, and it can fill 15 swimming pools, like 20,000 gallons each, per second. Ooh, per second. 15 swimming pools per second is a ton of water. Um, let's see. The storage of rivers flow to irrigate agricultural area. It also supplies drinking water to millions. Um, let's see. Because it's back at the Colorado River into what's called Lake Mead. Uh, Here's another fun fact. And this is something that's interesting, not that <laughs> that he used over three and a half million cubic yards of concrete. What's a cubic yard? A square yard. Yeah. How could a cubic yard be the same thing as a square yard? Come on. A cubic yard is taking three yardsticks. Line up a yardstick by a yardstick by a yardstick. So a cubic yard. Okay, now, most people don't realize this. Listen, Mike, most people don't realize this. The concrete industry is one of the most prominent money-making industries in the world, even today. It makes up, it makes up, some of it is like 12% of carbon emissions in the earth. Because making concrete, there is a huge CO2 byproduct when you create concrete. There's a lot of CO2 as a result of it. So, a project like this, although it's a huge feat, really ruins the earth. You don't realize it. But all these crazy skyscrapers are building in these Asian countries, in Japan, that use a ton of concrete, they, they completely ruin the earth. A lot of the carbon emissions today. So, I don't know if it was like maybe a month ago, a little bit less. I was reading an article about this new concrete that's being, well, not concrete, this new substance that's a replacement for concrete. Same structural integrity, costs more though. Costs more, but no CO2 byproduct. But what's the issue, obviously? Oh, more. So these people that don't care about the earth and just want to make money are lobbying to keep concrete as the main thing. And they're lobbying for huge concrete uh, contracts. Whereas this other substance that could easily replace it is trying to be pushed <laughs> by a lot of different you know, ecological lobbying firms. How much more is it? I don't know. I know it's more cost. I was a major concern. That's an incorrect way to say Just Google it real quick. Look up like new replacement for concrete. It'll probably pop up. I don't know what it is. You know, I have it bookmarked, so maybe I'll just put it on the news forum. I edit to the news forum. <laughs> sure. You don't have to, obviously. I've told you that many times. All right, let's take a look at what's called the channel, aka the channel, channel, tunnel. Okay. How many of you have heard of this? Anyone? Okay. So you've been to Europe. It's that you've heard of the way there? The tube. So first of all, it's 31 miles. Okay, 31 miles, it links Britain to the rest of Europe. Okay, it links Britain to the rest of Europe. Um, and it's more than a tunnel itself. What it also does is it allows machinery to go through the tunnel. So you've got one train tunnel running south, one train tunnel running north from France to UK, here's from UK to France. In the middle here, they've got the service tunnel that can also transfer different types of machinery throughout the process. It also is able to keep air pressure at the right level, having that middle tunnel that goes through it. Uh, let's see. These are the broadest, meaning the broadest, longest trains ever built. Uh, let's see. They travel about 100 miles an hour. And they do not, this is the interesting part. This is one of the first trains that carries vehicles longer distance. You don't board on foot, you board on your car. How many people have taken a Port Jet Ferry between Port Jet and Connecticut? You drive your car right on, right? And you just get on and you sit there. That's what this is, but connecting France specifically to 
the UK. Well, the UK to the rest of Europe. Okay, called the Chunnel. The Chunnel. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is interesting. We, we talk about pressure in physics, but in last year's physics class, I didn't really get to talk too much about the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect has to do with sound, but what I'm going to tell you is analogous to this. The Doppler effect is when an ambulance is, is driving towards you, the sound waves in the front get compressed, hearing that high pitch, and then when, they, when the sirens pass you, you hear a lower pitch, because the waves spread out. Imagine that, though, with pressure waves. So these trains are traveling so fast, and they're so large, to bless you, through a tunnel, that they create a lot of pressure in front of them. So this middle tunnel actually has pistons that move the whole time a train is going through to balance the pressure in the tunnel. Or else what would happen? Yeah, there'd be a backup of pressure, and there'd be a huge explosion, and the tunnel itself would explode in a different location. Not like a bomb, but just pressure that's built up. Different than a bomb where you have some sort of energy, like TNT, and its internal energy is converted to kinetic energy. Very different here. This would have to do with pressure. But there are pistons in, and I'll point to it, there are pistons in this middle tunnel right here that is able to keep the pressure equalized. You're seeing these different channels that connect them every 250 meters. All right. So this was interesting because a lot of people know about uh, Dubai now, and you know, in the last what, 10 years now, 10, 15 years. Um, what's really interesting is this: the simple fact that it took 200 million, 210, sorry, million cubic meters of rock that they had to literally move rock, sand, and limestone, and they had to create these islands. These are completely. Everybody knows these are man-made, right? These did not exist. These islands here. So these are completely man-made. Um, let's see what else. The amount of the amount of material used is enough to create a wall that could circle the Earth three times. The amount of material that they use for this. So, give me your input on this. You think this is a good or a bad? Thing? <laughs> They didn't have to do this. This is not helping society by any means, right? This is literally not helping society. All it's doing is making people that can afford to go there happy. Maybe it created some jobs, sure. That's, that's a good part, right? To make the islands and create jobs. To actually run the islands there's more jobs now. But it really did not help. So this is the difference in engineering I want to talk about now. Because a lot of things we've been going over have really helped society in some way or another. This, not as much. Okay, it really doesn't do much for us at all. Um, so when you're considering things in engineering, you know, not everything is always uh, geared to help others. Some of it is geared to make money. This is clearly something that was made to make money. Okay? So the reason I'm going to bring up this bridge, which is in, I think it's in Japan. It's, yeah, one of Japan's mainlands. Uh, it took two million workers, two million workers to create this. It's incredible. It took ten years to construct it. It connects the city of Kobe on Japan's main island to another island off the coast. Uh, before it opened, though, all you could do was take a ferry, but the waterway was prone to, to, was prone to a lot of storms. So this was created to help mankind. In 1955, for example, two ferries capsized alone that year and killed over 160 people. Um, it eventually caused the government to say, you know what, we need a bridge. Now, this is the longest suspension bridge in the world and its length is almost 2,000 meters. It's over a mile long. And it's the longest suspension bridge. <coughs> there are longer bridges, because I know I'm going to hear that right away. I see already people's hands are shaking their heads. Yes, there are definitely longer bridges. What are you going to say? If it's prone to storms, why would they build it? I mean, wouldn't it have been? There are probably stormy seasons, for sure. They probably built it in times when it wasn't bad. Yeah, wouldn't have destroyed it in the... <laughs> I mean, concrete bridges, I mean, think about, like, if you go over, like, the bridge to the beach, the Robert Rose of Jones Beach, those bridges have been around for years. Water's constantly rushing against it. It'll, it'll deteriorate, it'll grow, for sure. But they have, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they plan for the weather, you know what I mean? They weren't building on days where it was, like, monsoon rains and crazy tidal storms. But, yeah, almost 2,000 meters long. 
Last one for me. Let's finish today. The Grand Canyon Skywalk. Not just the Grand Canyon, but the Grand Canyon Skywalk. Okay, what time is this period tell? 13. Okay, so we get the same. So first, it is strong enough. Remember factor of safety? It can hold 71 million pounds. 71 million pounds. That's literally 71 airplanes. 747 flights. It is 1,200 meters above the Colorado River. Uh, 83,000 pounds of glass were used to make and 1 million pounds of steel to make it. That's pretty much it for that. We're going to stop with that one. Next class, we'll start with... Not the, uh, not the fact that it actually broke, but how it broke and why it broke, right? And how it failed. Uh, so from any catastrophe, the whole idea or any disaster or any failure, the whole concept is that you learn from it, you don't have it again. Now, one of the interesting parts was that the parts of the bridge that were actually uh, fixed to the bottom of the ocean floor were completely fine. Okay, from this portion over, look where the columns are, the actual, they're called like cable towers, where the towers themselves are. It was actually fine from here to land. It was that middle portion where it was simply held by that suspension portion of the bridge that started to oscillate. Um, the bridge itself is a mile long. Um, let's see. What else about it specifically that was good? It was opened in 1940. Um, it collapsed four months later. So it only lasted four months total. And as Julia said, no humans died, but a dog did die. Um, probably maybe even in that car that you saw. The actual replacement bridge was opened in 1950. And then they opened a second bridge next to it in 2007 to replace it all together. Uh, but this was like the first major catastrophe for a bridge. And the really crazy part was that it only took four months. So it had nothing to do with, um, with what's called creep. There's a term called creep. And creep means that over time something begins to like either erode or uh, get structurally unsound. This had nothing to do with that. It wasn't like this bridge was here for 50 years, like the Tappan Zee. Remember in the infrastructure video we watched? We kept talking about bridges that have been around for 60 years and have been no improvements. This is not the case. This was four months old, this bridge, before this actually occurred. Okay, so it was a huge deal. The fact that this actually happened in general uh, probably caused a lot of civil engineers to rethink their setups and structures for suspension bridges. Um, now, think about physics. Remember last year we talked about Hooke's Law? What could they have done? What are some things that possibly they have done to prevent this? Think about Hooke's Law. What we learn with Hooke's Law? What was Hooke's Law about? Anybody remember what it was about? Sure. Anybody remember what Hooke's Law was about? It was F equals KX was the formula? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what was it about? Yeah, it had to do with spring constants and their actual strength. You could, it's cold, you guys are shut the uh, It had to do with the strength of a spring, whatever, no small. So these suspension cables that are hanging aren't really springs in a sense, right? They have some give to them. They're allowed to, uh, they're allowed to expand and contract, but at a minimal amount, right? At a minimal amount. So when this started happening, when it started moving, that little bit of motion started to gain momentum more and more and more. And what happened is that momentum itself got out of control. It became what's called unbounded. In engineering, there's a term we use called unbounded. And if, uh, if the action or the motion of an object is unbounded, it means that there's no limitation to what's going to happen. So if something that's unbounded is uh, in like 1970, BMW had a car and their right passenger door, their front passenger door, its vibrations were actually unbounded. And what was happening was over, my, over speeds of like 60 miles an hour to almost 80 miles an hour, the door would start to vibrate. And you'd be sitting there, not the driver's side door, the passenger front door, but you'd be sitting there and the door would literally be shaking. And obviously, whether or not people would die from it, people freaked out, right? You don't want to be driving a car and some of the door is just shaking uncontrollably. And the issue that they were having, it, well, the problem that they were having was this. The vibrations themselves were not being minimized by even the locking mechanism, nothing. So eventually what would happen is 
if these vibrations were not controlled, the door was snapping open, and the actual lock mechanism was breaking. So they had to recall on all these doors, on all these cars, had to replace them with completely different doors. The way that they studied this, it was really cool. I learned about this in my differential, a uh, class called differential equations, it's like calculus, I'm a French engineer. And I learned about this specific instance. And they took springs, and they took springs, and they put springs all over the door. Sets of springs, like a matrix of springs. A bunch of them in different locations. And they studied the periodic motion of those springs, how much they were uh, flexing, or how much they were exp uh, expanding and compressing over a given time period, and they followed that pattern. They were able to analyze that actual motion to then take that motion and dampen it. Dampening motion means the control the motion. So they had to understand physically what was happening. So they had to take these cars, test run them at those speeds that were causing the problems, monitor what was happening, model it with some sort of a sine or cosine wave, which is what you'll see when you have anything that's periodic, and then they have to minimize that actual value. Well, this idea is along the same lines, okay, with the suspension cables. So that middle portion of the bridge had to be completely revamped. They couldn't ever consider doing something the same way they had made this bridge in the past, in the, whatever it was, the 50s. Well, who's heard of Chernobyl before? Anybody know enough to explain? Paul? Okay. Um, so, what happened was one of the reactors um, had a meltdown. So basically, yeah, the, it came too hot. No, the core melted. Um, and what happened was um, that basically explore, exposed radioactive materials to the whole town of Chernobyl, and they had to evacuate the town. Yeah, it was in, you're right, well, it was in, oh, let's see what it was, uh, in the 80s. So in the 80s, that, but that's exactly right. The only thing, the one other thing is that actually the reactor itself ended up exploding. Um, the problem was, and I'm going to read directly because I remember this from last year, it had to do with a power surge, right? And then the power surge, after that happened, there was an emergency shutdown. But unfortunately, the shutdown was overridden, and they continued to run the actual reactors. So when there's... Any, any, anything that could cause catastrophe, there's always a fast So if you're in something like a nuclear power plant and temperature before it gets too high, naturally all these systems are going to shut down or the cooling systems are going to kick in and the actual other systems that are generating energy and using that nuclear reaction to harness energy, those values, those, uh, those machines are not going to run anymore. But the system turned back on. And when the system turned back on, there was a giant spike in the power output, which caused that reactor to actually explode. Now, the biggest issue is what Paul mentioned at the end. When this happened, it released a lot of natural radiation, and the people in the area became affected. Crop life, animal life. Have you ever seen like videos of like these like you know five-legged deers and deer and boar and these different mutations that have occurred as a result of what happened at Chernobyl? Is there a conspiracy that the U.S. Like, planned this? I never heard that, is there? It? Yeah, it's like, it's like, you're up there, you're up there, you're up there, you're just like, there's no way to get, like, the, the like, it was the same. Itself. Yeah, like, there's no way that you just, like, turn on the, the crack to just turn on itself. I wonder, I don't know. I never heard that spirit, conspiracy. Yeah, oh. hey, it's conspiracy for everything. That's very possible. I, I bet you a lot of people say that. I'm not saying that either. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's the main points. The other part, well, that's the last piece. The, the biggest issue also has to do with fallout. So the, all the mm, ash, all the stuff that comes out as a result of the actual explosion started to come down. And those particles themselves get into the soil, and then when you try to grow crops for the next 30, 40 years, they were having a lot of issues with crop life as well. Yeah, this was a big deal. It, it caused a lot of people to second guess whether or not we wanted to use any sort of nuclear reactions or nuclear power plants. And even to this day, we know that a lot of people are still hesitant. All right. Um, this was kind of a big catastrophe. It happened in 1944. Uh, 130 people ended up dying, and it destroyed an entire square mile in Cleveland. So a square mile, you know, is a mile by a mile, right? How many miles in Manhattan? Do you want to know? Uh, how, how many miles across? A mile by eight miles. It's about it's about a mile across. I know that. Yeah. I think the the height of Manhattan or the, the 
but it depends on how far you consider it. It's only like four or five miles or something. From no, the it's it's like when you tip to the battery park, it's like seven and then Okay. Like so a mile by mile would be like an eighth of Manhattan. Imagine like imagine all of like mm, let's see, probably like I'm, I'm trying to think of like a location, a location. Uh, 20 blocks, they say, is about a mile this way. So from like 14th Street to 34th Street, all of Manhattan would be gone. That's how big this explosion was. It completely devastated and destroyed an entire square mile. Um, here's what happened. At 2.30 in the afternoon on a Friday, a ground storage tank that had liquefied natural gas, so natural gas that occurs, but in the liquid state, so it keeps it cool, um, it began to emit like a vapor out the side of it. And on the side of it, it occurred, let me show you just so you can see. The actual tank, imagine being a cylinder, okay, was sealed. And a cylinder can't be one solid piece of metal. Well, now it might be able to because we can 3D print. But prior to this, you took sheet metal and it had to be rolled, and then there was a seam. The seam was sealed by either methods of welding or um, maybe some rivets were in place, but it depends on how the seal was in place. The seal started leaking vapors uh, out the side of the tank itself. And then what happened was the gas from inside mixed with air and gas from the sewer, it got ignited. Now, it's so, if there's a gas leak, it's so scary because it's so easy for a gas leak to get ignited. Anything that causes any spark will ignite if there's a gas leak. That's why when you're home and you have like any sense of a smell for gas and you smell it, First thing you want to do is make sure that all your burners are off, everything's off completely. Like, I mean, I can't tell you. So, I live in an old, old house that has gas burners, not electric. And one of the gas burners does not actually have a, a spark plug on it. I need to replace it. It's been like a month now. And it makes me nervous that somebody, if you use it though, if you turn it on, what is it doing? It's just leaking gas. It's putting out gas the whole time. So you got to be careful that you don't try to turn your burner on, leave it on for too long. And then the gas fills up the room and suddenly you turn on the actual one of the burners that works, the whole house will go up. But that's what happened here. And what was crazy was this occurred not only in the tank explosion, but also the whole sewer line in the ground. So what happened is manholes were shot over like two miles in the air. I know that that sounds crazy. Think about having a manhole. Those are like, you know, we're talking like 50, 60, 70, 80 pounds, not light at all. They shot over a mile. If that hit like a building, you go right through a building. It's not going to be stopped by steel. It's not going to be stopped by almost anything. So there were a ton of deaths, even several miles. Like one was found, they found a manhole cover seven miles east of the explosion. Seven miles. Think about how much energy that must take. You guys learned last year with me, potential energy. How much energy must it take for a manhole cover to go seven miles? That's incredible. So this explosion was huge. Um, let's see. So they thought it was going to be okay for a while, because at the first, the only, only one of the tanks exploded. So they ended up sending a lot of people home for work that day, and only a few people stayed to monitor. And then there was a second explosion, actually, <coughs> at ground level that caused another, like, eight tanks to chain react. All right, let's take a look at the next one. This is the dam flood. And then we talked about how important it is that dams are structurally sound. Because when a dam fails, anything that's down, downstream of the dam itself is going to get completely obliterated by the amount of water that's coming through. So this was called the St. Francis Dam Flood. Uh, the big deal about this was there was a major engineer that was in charge of this whole thing. His name was William Mulholland. He was the actual prime, like the head engineer on the job. He did the inspection himself at the end, and the dam actually failed hours after it was suspected. So that the Tacoma Narrows Bridge we saw that failed only, you know, a few, was it four days, I think, after it was? Months. Four months after it was actually open. This actually failed only hours after it was actually inspected. There were 12 and a half billion gallons of water that flooded Santa Clara Valley. Imagine a 10-story wall of water coming at you. So we're on the fourth floor, right? We're on the fourth floor here. So go, take this building double the size at least. That's how much water in height was literally coming toward the town or the Santa Clara Valley area in LA. Uh, it traveled at 20 miles an hour. 
So not only are we looking at a 10 story wall of water, but it's coming at 20 miles an hour toward people. Uh, let's see. And not until the next morning did the water start to even lower. A lot of it was still flooded. It was buried under 20 feet of mud and debris. So 20 feet on top of people. Uh, let's see. The death count was 450 people, including like 60 students, young, young school children. So it was a huge, huge disaster. What do you think happened to that engineer? Fire. Yeah, he got more than fire. He had He got more than fire, yeah. He knocked him back. He got fined. He got fined, no, no. He, he got more than fired. Obviously, he was never able to practice in engineering again. I'm sure there were, you know, lawsuits pressed against him for the rest of his life. Obviously, it was an intentional, so it's not like that. But the guy was never able to practice ever again. I mean, it's the, it's the equivalent of malpractice, right? But malpractice on like a mass scale. Okay, not like one person getting injured, but 450 people dying all at once. Wait, the engineer the inspector? The head engineer was the inspector himself. Oh. The, don't forget, this was in 1928. <laughs> Yeah. Na oh, nowadays there's 50 head engineers on the job, and there's inspectors from outside corporations coming in to inspect, and they're you know they're contractors. They're not through the same engineering mm, corporation, whatever it may be, firm. Yeah. Pretty much, he said, "Oh, this looks good. We did a good job. We're good to go." They opened the dam, or they they you know started. I shouldn't say even open a dam. They. Uh, I don't know how you, how do you like start a dam. I guess I should. And then you open that portion up, allowing the water to flow down. That would make sense, yeah. So they're used to generate, control the flow of water and generate energy. It's like a resistor. What? What do you use that water? To generate, well, it depends on the water. If it's fresh water, sure. But it's generating energy. Remember resistors and electrical circuits control the flow of the current? Yeah. It's the same thing as a dam. It controls the actual volumetric flow rate coming through. Who knows about the, ch uh, the challenger? Anybody know about reasoning? What is it? Yeah. The you know about what happened? I mean, that's the one yes, but not enough to explain it for you. You know what I'm saying? One of the things was thinking. Yes, but there was more than a fuel tank. Only, 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 only. The fuel tank is what happened. There was something that caused the fuel tank to explode into the ocean. It wasn't falling off, it was something else. Only not all the rockets fired. So here's what happened. On the, on the morning of, the temperatures were dramatically lower than they expected. So the engineers on job said, you know what, we should postpone this launch. Why should we postpone this launch? Well, what happens is some of the materials that were used to hold the rocket boosters, the solid rocket boosters in place, called O-rings, those rings are like, uh, like washers. Okay, the washers are able to keep space between a bolt and the actual thing that's being bolted to. So the actual rings themselves are made out of a material that works fine under normal weather conditions. This happened to be a freak day where it was really, really cold. And the engineers were warning this, like, you know what, there's a possible possibility of failure. The O-rings haven't been tested under whatever the temperature was, blah, blah, blah. The problem was that this was being televised. It was a huge deal. They did not want to change every political figure there, all these, you know, whether it was a governor or a city mayor, uh, maybe a mayor, I forgot actually where it was, kept pushing him to push through with it. Uh, the engineers in charge kept saying not to do it, don't do it, over and over. Eventually, it got vetoed, their, their, their desire to halt the whole entire thing got vetoed. It took off, the O-ring itself broke, it was brittle, it broke itself, the actual rocket booster caused the leak, it exploded, and the Challenger itself exploded. Not even... What was it? A minute after? Yeah, 73 seconds after launch. So it was the primary and secondary O-ring on the rocket booster on the right side of the actual uh, shuttle. The gas leaked and then it exploded. But the biggest deal here, obviously, right, was that the NASA engineers and managers got completely ignored. And they got completely ignored all because of politics, all because of money. So there was an instance of where, what's that? A lot of blame went into the engineers, but obviously NASA came out right away and said, we said this should have been postponed, this should not have taken place, it had nothing to do with us wanting to do this. So it was like a, you know, a blame party, where everybody would blame someone else. Uh, but this was like one of the biggest examples of having some battles between morals, like morals and ethics, versus economics, where people just want to make money versus doing the right thing. 
And this wasn't the first time this had happened, meaning not a space shuttle, but in general, money causing people's views to become uh, skewed, and then as a result, human lives being the, being the cost. Two more. The last one's pretty interesting, too. I thought I had a different one. Maybe that's what's... Uh, so, this was an airship disaster. Who's heard of the, um, the actual Heidelberg? Oh, yeah. Right? The actual blimp? This was actually worse <coughs> than that. Um, and most people don't know too much about it. So, the first thing was that this occurred in... Let's see, when was the actual year? What year was it? Well, it was at night. So, it departed at night around 6 o'clock. It was leaving from... Leaving from, it was stopping rather in Egypt to refuel. Uh, when it was over France, what happened was winds tore the back outer covering and it exposed what's called the airbags. Do you know how for these, you know how this work, these air, these air buses? Anybody have the same idea about the planes in there? So it's filled with air, the gas will fly in the air, cause the actual overall density of it to become less than air, which means it to float. So inside of these, they're very unsafe. I mean, it's literally, imagine there's just gas inside of it. You light somehow this leak, and there's a spark, the whole thing's going to explode. So these are, these are not really used anymore, as you have to obviously know, when the airplane's there. So the actual uh, air gas bag, I guess you call it, it ruptured itself. Uh, that part itself started to explode, well, one of them exploded, which caused a crash into like the side of the hill near Paris. It was very, moving very slow, only 10 miles an hour. But that crash ignited more hydrogen to then explode and cause a chain reaction. There were 54 passengers, of which 46 died. Out of the others, the other six, two of them died in the house, and the other four were really, four were really bad, terrible lives the rest of their life. They were covered by like 30 degree burns, they were never let out of the hospital. No do they now? No, like you now. Sure, but this was the beginning yeah. when there was hydrogen. Yeah. It was hydrogen gas, which is much, much more flammable than we want, you know, yeah. in airplanes. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you take like a, what's that called, a hot air balloon right now? Hot air balloons obviously not the same thing. Literally, they do have balloons in the But they go over like, they're not for, they're not for traveling overseas. Yeah, they're like, they not going over like a, yeah, it's over like the football stadium in the game. That's where they are for cattle. But these, these were for carrying people. These were commercial. Uh, Alright, last one for the day. It's kind of funny. It's kind of funny when you think about what happened. Uh, this is called the, the Boston Molasses Disaster. So, anybody heard of this one before? Yeah. You heard of this one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Not the Boston Tea Party. Not the Boston Tea Party. So, the Boston Molasses Disaster. So, here's what happened. So there was a, they, at, this, uh, at this location in Boston, they had these huge molasses tanks. The tank was 50 feet high, listen, 50 feet high, 90 feet in diameter. It contained 2.3 million gallons of molasses. 2.3 million, a ridiculous amount of molasses. Molasses, we know, is like syrup, right? Okay. Um, so unfortunately what happened was, it, they were, remember, that, remember that figure I just drew? Let me draw it again. So you have a cylinder. One of the seams had rivets. Rivets are like bolts. Ever look on the side of an airplane, you see all these little bolts sticking out the side on the plane? They're called rivets, really. Rivets are put in, and then the bottom is like snapped back. It's not like a bolt where it's like a nut at the bottom, but it's actually fixed. Permanent. Yeah, it's a permanent fixture. These, unfortunately, were not permanent. They started to... Actually, so the pressure inside was too much, the actual started to fail, and these were shooting out of it like a machine gun. Apparently the rivets killed a lot of people first. <laughs> then what happened was nearby, well, it started to collapse. The collapse of one of them caused a few others to collapse, and there was a 15-foot tall uh, wave of molasses that actually covered the town. Imagine dying of molasses. Like, that's Terrible. Like water's bad. Uh, they suffocated. Twenty-one died. One hundred fifty were injured. Why were these just sitting there? Like in the well, they weren't just sitting. There. It, just, it happened so fast. You can't get out of the way. So the the way. Here's the crazy part, though. It moved at thirty-five miles an hour. That's how much pressure there was. The molasses was traveling thirty-five miles an hour, 
15 feet high. It actually caused, so they have these elevated trains in part of, or they had in part of Boston. It caused the elevated train to lift off the track and the train was literally floating in the molasses. Like the train itself got derailed and was floating through molasses, eventually sunk into the molasses. Isn't that a higher density of water so I think it's harder? It's his viscosity that's different. Viscosity has to do with the sheer stress in the fluid, so it doesn't move past things very easily. So to get out of it, you literally like, can't move. Your sheer stress is so much. We're talking about sheer stress this year, but you can't like swim out of it. That's that's why it's scary. No, well, there's fluid inside it, and something must have happened with the regulation of the amount of fluid, and they must have had fluid pumping into the lines. And these, I mean, there's pressure always on any scene. So as they were pumping fluid in, they must have somehow miscalculated or something. It doesn't say specifically. All it says is that the rivets themselves start to fail, and they start to shoot out the side, and then the seam itself split open, causing the glass to pour out. Yeah, there's got to be. So, and guys, in any of these tanks, even think about when you grow in the summer. When you grow in the summer, there's a pressure gauge on the top of that tank, right? So that you don't have the pressure too high, and it explodes. That's the same idea here. The pressure needs to be regulated. If something goes wrong in the pot in the process of regulating that pressure, maybe the pressure gauge isn't working. That's why if you ever work as an engineer or in a in a factory or somewhere like that, you're gonna see that they inspect things all the time. They come in and they literally test the pressure gauge. They test the monitors. Anything that's a fail-safe mechanism gets tested regularly because of the fact that if that gauge isn't working, you know what you see on your screen? If I'm the head engineer, I see, okay. Very little pressure. Everything's great. But maybe that gauge isn't right. But really, there's a ton of pressure. So we say, pump more into the line. Well, there's a lot of pressure there because the gauge isn't working. We keep pumping more of this fluid into the line. Eventually, it's going to explode. So when a small gauge isn't working, it causes a huge problem down the line. All right, that was the last one. So um, what you definitely can expect on Friday in class is a small assignment of some sorts. Be ready to do that and be ready to turn in at the end of the period. I'm going to include that assignment in your estimate. If you either A, didn't do well in the reading quizzes, or B, you were not really contributing much to the project, or C, we have a project grade for that. I give you like a classroom grade for that. Uh, what other grades you have? Either way, if you think you aren't doing too well, make sure, obviously, that you get the